welcome. Welcome to this uh, um, medal lecture uh, to be given by Jean-Pierre Brun. Jean-Pierre Brun is, uh, has uh, received the Arthur Holmes uh, medal from the EDU. In the EDU we value science and we also try to um, uh, award eminent scientists uh, with uh, our medal series and uh, Jean-Pierre has uh, won the, uh, one of the union medals. We have four union medals, one for uh, scientific activity in particular in relation to third world countries. We have uh, then three more of which uh, the Arthur Holmes medal from the name of uh, Holmes is uh, given within the solid earth uh, sciences and uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Jean-Pierre, I know him well and uh, for many years and I find I was very pleased personally when I saw that uh, the award committee had uh, proposed uh, uh, Jean-Pierre for, for this medal. And, uh, you're not here to listen to me, so I'll just read the, the short citation aloud. And then I'll also just say that uh, I had looked forward to seeing or to hearing this uh, lecture, but unfortunately I have to run for, uh, uh, for a meeting that I was called to at a short notice. And uh, Irina Artemieva will lead the discussion afterwards. So Jean-Pierre Bon has received the Arthur Holmes Medal, uh, which also carries honorary membership of the EDU. Uh, for pioneering fundamental research by combining multi-scale field observations with novel experimental approaches for the development of innovative concepts in structural geology and tectonics. And uh, the title of the talk is Shorter, the Extending Lithosphere, which is really a wide subject. Uh, I would have loved to hear it, but Jean-Pierre told me that he has allowed streaming so we can have a chance to hear the talk later on also. So please, um, Jean-Pierre, come to the floor. And congratulations uh, with uh, the Holmes Medal. to everyone. It's very impressive to see such a room and I hope that uh, this uh, title will be suitable for you. I, I did some other type of research but I expected that uh, discussing about the extension of the lithosphere could be of interest for a number of people. The, my first point is how I came to, to extension and, and why during three decades I continue to, to work mostly on that topic, not only but mostly. This happened in the 80s. The first, so I will show you why I, I became engaged in, in the extension. In 82, uh, Xavier de Pichon was working on the Bay of Biscay uh, here and he was trying to understand if the tilted blocks could give an amount of the stretching of the margin. And he came to, to Rennes when I was at that time to make a seminar and he asked me if I could try to make a model of that and uh, discussing with him, I, I get the idea of putting sand uh, on silicon putty and this give uh, tilted blocks and this is an historical one because this is the first one. and, and uh, this finding, of course, uh, has been uh, opening new doors and, and, and in tectonic modeling in general. Uh, this was 82. In 87, I was asked if I would, would like to participate to diving in, in the, at the tip of the Aden Gulf in, in Afar and diving on down to 2,500 meters to look at the faulting related to that with two famous uh, uh, co-PI 
that certainly you know. Um, in 86, the, the scientific council of uh, uh, Ecoras, who was discussing with Decorup on the German side to make a big section across the Rhine Graben, uh, proposed me to be the PI, the, the French PI for, the, for this project, and with Friedemann Wenzel on the other side, uh, from, from the German side. Uh, and, and in, in 86, uh, I was in a meeting in England, and uh, I met uh, George Davis, and he invited us to come in Tucson and to visit the core complex in Arizona with him. It was a fantastic introduction, and I stayed there for a PhD <coughs> project. And in 87, uh, the, spot, um, the spot satellite was launched that offer uh, a 10 meter resolution on a satellite image in stereoscopy. So it was possible to make a, an incredible analysis of a, a big area because there is almost no vegetation there and the erosion is very small. So it was a fantastic uh, project. And uh, Paul Taponier, who was in charge for the CNRS of uh, a new program called Test Technoscope, asked me if I could launch something on this area. Uh, in 87, because I've been in, in the basin and range looking at the core complex there, Jean Aubouin was um, um, a bit intrigued by a paper by Gordon Lister that I saw in the room uh, is there. And uh, he asked me if I could have a look to that and give to him my opinion about it. And uh, a, a young uh, PhD student coming back from Japan, Laurent Jolivet, came to me and said, okay, can I come with you? And we went there. Of course, uh, there were core complex, uh, but uh, 30 years after, Laurent and I are still there because this is such a, an exceptional place, the Aegean, to understand extension that, that we, we cannot escape continuing. And uh, in 89, uh, a, a former professor of mine who was my neighbor in Paris, Gilbert Boileau, get a, a drilling here uh, at the front of the Galicia margin, and uh, he, he showed that the, the <coughs> periodotite there, just at the front here, were very strongly sheared, and he asked me if, um, if I could provide him a student uh, who could be able to uh, study these rocks, what I did, of course, but at the same time, uh, we started to discuss because he, his idea was that uh, what we observe in, the, in Galicia was due to a big uh, normal fault cross-cutting and the, 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 the lithosphere and then making the mantle arriving to the surface. But then I say to him, I have a problem with this because how do you explain the very strong tilting that we have on top of this? And he said, okay. Uh, would you like to do some modeling on that? And then with the student, we did that. And finally, another opportunity was uh, coming from IFREMER, the, the Institute for Oceanography in France, who, where a group of people were working here in the Mons Ridge, where on 400 kilometers you have not a single transform fault, and everything is oblique, so we had the possibility to get them the uh, sea beam uh, data and to work on that with a satisfying resolution, 100 meter, and to map the fault on quite a big distance. So all in all, in, in one decade, I get so much offer that, that uh, I couldn't escape continuing on that. Let's then go back to, to the problem. Here you have two uh, topographic image of um, uh, two famous area for extension. Uh, to the, the left you have the Rhine Graben here. That is a very localized extension in the European uh, lithosphere. And here you have a view of uh, the basin and range where you have on almost the same, the same distance a, a totally different uh, pattern. So this is very localized stretching of the lithosphere, and this is very distributed. And uh, I propose that we first try to understand how 
we can explain this uh, potentially. In 91, uh, Roger Bach made a, a fantastic paper where he, he made the difference between what he called narrow rift mode, wide rift mode, the localized and the distributed. Uh, as a function of the temperature, uh, here is the heat flux, 80 milliwatt per square meter and 660 here. And he put another mode here that is the core complex. So the, here you have a more temperature that is incredibly high. Here that is at, at, at the Moho, you have more than 1200 centigrade. And here uh, something a bit less. And here at the Moho, you have something around 500 uh, centigrade. Um, but if you look at the strength profile, you see that the strength profile uh, changed very much from uh, the narrow rift to the core complex. And uh, this large uh, variation has obvious uh, consequences on the deformation pattern. Um, using using the, the, this technique, putting sand on silicon putty, we discover with one of my PhD who is possibly in the room, Pascal Allemand in 1990. Um, through very simple experiment, here you have uh, three models deform at the same velocity, one centimeter per hour. But here the thickness of the sand is the same than the silicon. Here it is the double, and here it is the triple. And you see immediately that the pattern of deformation is not at all the same. Because here we have an increase in the brittle uh, thickness and then the brittle strength. And uh, when we increase the brittle strength, we localize more the deformation. When we have uh, almost equal thicknesses of the two material, we distribute the deformation on a bigger distance. And these three experiments, the central one is the same than, than here in the first, uh, we change the velocity. This is five centimeter per hour and this is five millimeter per hour. So you have one order of magnitude of difference between the base and the top. And what you see immediately is that when the, the velocity is very low, we have a very localized deformation. When you increase the velocity, we have a distributed deformation. And the reason is very easy to understand. Uh, uh, the strength of the ductile layer is the product of the strain rate by the viscosity. So when you increase the velocity, you increase the, the strength of the ductile layer, then you couple more strongly the two layers, and then you distribute the deformation. The same occurs at the scale of, uh, of uh, the, the lithosphere. Uh, I don't want to comment more, but this is a very low velocity, and this is a high velocity. So you see that we have a very strong coupling here between the mantle and the crustal layer, and here we have a very localized deformation of the Rhine-Graben type. To go a bit further on that, it's better to look at modeling that can help to understand the effect of temperature. And here you have a series of models with uh, three types of uh, temperature at the Moho, uh, 350, 480, and 750. And the velocity is one centimeter year, one millimeter year per year. So you see that when we have temperature of the Moho lower than 700, uh, we have a very high strength layer below the Moho here and there. And then we obtain a necking zone here uh, at this uh, place in the sub Moho mantle. And um, if you go to a lower mode temperature, you see that here we have two shear zones like that. And if you decrease the velocity, you keep the same temperature, would decrease the velocity, then you obtain here uh, a, a, a double uh, shear zone pattern here that cross each other here in the upper high strength, uh, the high strength sub mode mantle. If you have a temperature higher than 750, then you have no more high strength layer below the Moho, and you get 
uh, uh, very distributed deformation of uh, wide range, uh, wide rift uh, type. We can call that cold lithosphere and this hot lithosphere to, to simplify things. And uh, an interesting point is that here, when we decrease the velocity for a given temperature, we stimulate, we activate a decollement between the mantle and the upper crust. And I insist on the term décollement because it is for, in the common use today, décollement and detachment are considered to be the same. But in fact, they are not the same from a mechanical point of view. A décollement is a layer between two strong layers, a weak layer, that channelize uh, the deformation. And, and, and uh, you, if, to understand the development of passive margin, this is important. I will come back on that later. Now, you see that we have not any core complex in the model that I show you. Uh, so just an historical point on the core complex. Um, in 1977, uh, uh, in Tucson, there was a Penrose conference that, that was a major point because they, they created really the basis for a core complex. Um, after, let's say, 10 years of field work in the basin and ranch by the American geologists. And they describe uh, the fact that we had a basement terrain uh, separated from a covered terrain by a low angle zone with myelonites and low angle normal fault, on top of which you have non metamorphosed uh, rocks uh, faulted at high angle with uh, sediment and volcanics. And uh, this is a, a summary that made by Peter Carney in 1980 in the famous book coming from that. And immediately after this, there was a, a very big enthusiasm on, on the core complex. And uh, a number of people tried to find simple explanation for that. So uh, a first model that became absolutely famous was proposed by Brian Warnke. And uh, he, he considered that it was a, f a fault that uh, made the lower crust arriving at the surface, the ductile crust arriving at the surface, uh, through the displacement uh, along a low angle fault cut cost cutting the wool lithosphere. Then it was modified by uh, Spencer and Gordon Lister again made uh, the point that uh, if we have a lower uh, uh, ductile uh, layer that we could have uh, the faulting connected to an horizontal ductile shear zone. Uh, so this, this evolution was from 81 to 89, but at the end of the 80s, um, uh, Roger back in one end from a theoretical point of view and Wernicke and Axen uh, from uh, observation in, um, in the basin and ranch in the field uh, describe what is called now rolling inch model. I don't know if this word is proper, but it is called like that. And uh, the difference is that here the fault is, the detachment is low angle from the beginning, and here it becomes low angle by progressive extension. The faults bend, and uh, the new faults are still uh, steeply dipping here, and the detachment become almost horizontal. Oh, just a point. Uh, the rolling inch model is favored in many studies today, but the simple shear model has still some defender uh, in some uh, field example. So the debate is still continuing uh, 30 years after. And um, uh, more generally, it is interesting to consider that, that uh, we have two types of exhumation of, uh, in extension of deep crust or mantle rocks. So I put here the lithosphere, oceanic or continental. Uh, in metamorphic core complex, it is the crust, the ductile crust that is exhumed. In oceanic core complex, it is the mantle directly at the oceanic ridge. And uh, in passive margin, following the discovery uh, uh, at the tip of the Galicia margin, uh, we know that the mantle can exhume also in the so-called magma poor passive margins. Just a few words about, I don't want to elaborate much on that, but a few words about the oceanic core complex. Um, 
it was noticed since um, uh, the, um, the early 80s that uh, at uh, some oceanic ridges, the, uh, some faults were rather flat. But in fact, it is in the, the middle of the, the 90s that people really sample uh, pieces of metal or magmas, uh, like gabbros, uh, at the oceanic ridge that were not supposed to be there because, in general, the model that we had in, in mind before that was that the crust, the oceanic crust, was covered by uh, volcanics. And uh, so uh, Tisholki and Lin proposed something looking like um, uh, a core complex in the rolling inch type. And, but uh, this was definitely accepted when uh, Kahn and, and co-workers found uh, rather flat surfaces with very, strongly, uh, with very strong corrugation in the direction of opening uh, at, at the beginning, uh, at the intersection between transform fault and actual valleys. And um, then it was a big enthusiasm uh, among the oceanographic community and they made a lot of work on that, and uh, we learned that in the, in the, in the mid-Atlantic reach where we have a rather slow spreading rate, uh, let's consider that this is between 2 and 5.5 centimeters per year, we have a volcanic axis, and then on one side we can have an exhumed mantle with a, 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 a detachment uh, dipping steeper at the front, and very flat at the top. And uh, in ultra slow spreading uh, rate ridges where the, the velocity is lower than two centimeters per year, uh, we have something uh, absolutely spectacular like in the Southwest Indian Ridge where we have only um, um, peridotites and gabbros uh, and uh, we can have at some places as described by Soter and co-workers quite recently, um, detachment cross-cutting each other with two different sides of dip. Uh, of course, this uh, suggested uh, immediately modeling, and uh, uh, Lavier and Buck made uh, several contributions on that and uh, explained how we can have this shape of detachment that we see uh, in the core complex in the, in the ocean. And in the ocean, uh, the rolling inch model has been rapidly and widely accepted by the wool community. Now, let's have a quick look to, uh, to the passive margin. So, I introduced that problem uh, just uh, a few slides before. And uh, if we consider that this is the section of the, the Galicia margin, and this can be explained like that, we have to explain how we can have a very strong stretching of the upper plate on top of this the low angle uh, shear zone. And why we have two opposite sense of shear, the top here is sheared toward the ocean and the, the periodotides are sheared top toward the continent. So uh, what we try with uh, Mario Dil Bellier, uh, the first result were published in 91, but, but Possibly you know what we did in 96. Uh, we, we, we took a four layer model, brittle, ductile, brittle, ductile, and just we pull. Not, not more difficult than that. We pull, and we pull that and we obtain the exhumation of the ductile mantle here at the tip. The model was stopped when it was arriving at the surface. Uh, here is a model that is less stretched to be able to map uh, the sense of shear. And uh, it's possible to show from that that we have two shear zones cross-cutting each other, just like we observe in the numerical model here. And uh, the, the top of the shear zone here is just the decollement that you see here. So deformation is localized in uh, uh, a weaker zone be between the upper crust and, and the mantle. So this provided a simple explanation for opposite sense of shear in crust and mantle. And uh, we, we, we can consider that this is basically 
a model of a symmetrical or nearly symmetrical necking of the continental lithosphere. More recently, some colleagues uh, uh, <coughs> using numerical models obtain uh, patterns that are extremely asymmetrical. Here it is by, by Sasha Brun and co-workers quite recently, and you see uh, progressively how you have a detachment uh, uh, controlling the, the wool thing, and um, this is a totally asymmetrical uh, model, and uh, this is Thibault Diretz and co-workers, uh, recently too, uh, where you have an, a rheological anisotropy in the crust and in the mantle, and uh, with such an anisotropy where you have a, 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 a middle feuille, a cake, with strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak layer, uh, when you stretch that, you favor the development of a big shear zone uh, cross-cutting the wool lithosphere too. Not the wool lithosphere, the crust and the submarine mantle, let's say. The point is that we obtain that here because we have a strong strain softening in the rocks. If you have a strong strain softening, that means that where you start to deform, it becomes easier to deform. And uh, if you start with two shear zones, you will favor one. And here it is the anisotropy. And you see that here you see the mantle moving up, here, and then we have an inconformity between the crust and the mantle, and we have the same thing here. So this is a big question for the future. How can we observe that? How can we test that? So I see some seismologists in the room, uh, if they find a way for us to test that, because the seismic used by uh, the classical re reflection seismic is totally unable to see that. But if we can find something in the future to test if this can happen or not, it will be a great improvement. Let's go back to the metamorphic core complex, and uh, in particular, how do they form, and how large-scale detachment can develop. Um, with uh, my, my student, um, <coughs> Céline Tirel and uh, Genia Burov, um, uh, we made a, a series of numerical models to, to, to try to understand the development of a core complex in the in, um, in brittle ductile lithosphere. Here, you, uh, each point corresponds to a model, and the numbers are the more temperature for the different model. And you see that in this domain here, so this is the heat flow and this is the crustal thickness. And in this blue domain, we get something looking like a passive margin. So a rift that extending give a passive margin. And in the yellow domain, we obtain a, a, a core complex, the mole remains almost flat, and we have the, duck, the lower part of the duct line Crust moving up. Here, everything is stretched, but maintained. You have, we have absolutely uh, no, no development of a core complex, and we have an arching of the moho, where, whereas the, here the moho is flat. So we have two modes of localized deformation. One is in a hot lithosphere here, and here in a cold lithosphere. Um, this was made quite recently, what I I just show you, but previous to that, we, we used with Dimitrios Socrates uh, a very simple model where we have a layer of silicon putty and a layer of sand, and we put a small uh, heterogeneity here, uh, whose viscosity is a bit lower, less than one order of magnitude, a bit lower than, than the, the rest of the layer. And when we let the system spreading, we obtain a graben and blocks that tilt like this. And you see that after a certain amount of uh, displacement, these are three different models, uh, we obtain a, a shear zone here with com a complicated pattern of faults. And uh, at the end, the uh, ductile material is arriving to the surface. So this is the general model we, 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 we propose from that. And uh, the, the interesting point here is that this, this anomaly was just made to localize the formation, of course. 
Uh, we have a graben at the beginning, and the graben in opens, and it is the opening of this graben that helped the ductile material to arrive to the surface. And we can compare this with some uh, core complex well, well studied in the Basin and Ranch, and this one is from uh, the Snake Ranch, a famous Snake Ranch, where Elizabeth Miller and his co-workers made a lot of work. Well, you have here the tilted blocks that are rather similar to what we observe here. We have a, a, a banding making a dome here of the ductile uh, material. And here is another uh, famous example from uh, Arizona by Spencer and Reynolds, uh, the back skin row height core complex, where you have uh, very strongly tilted blocks with uh, steep fold that became absolutely flat here, and the detachment here on top with small blocks here on top, and uh, other folds on, on top of the detachment. Uh, these two examples, among several others I could have shown, uh, are not in bad agreement at all uh, with what we observe with our very simplistic model. Uh, now let's have a look to one of the numerical models. So what you, the film you see here, uh, the blue color is very low strain, and the red color is very high strain. Uh, so you see that, and uh, if you want to see the, the different step, uh, they are fixed here on top. Uh, let's start here. It starts as a graben, and progressively we, we made a detachment here, red, plunging, steeper at the front and connected with the uh, a flat shear zone in the ductile crest here. And to the other side, you see that the shear zone is moving in that direction. So I will, oh, I made something wrong. I'm sorry, it is a Microsoft error. <laughs> it, it, is, it is written on the screen. PowerPoint detected a Microsoft uh, problem. So let me, let me try something. It's okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Okay, look at the fixed, um, the fixed image. So the, the, the first one is just layered with colors. The moho is there between the yellow and uh, the pink. The next image is the strain rate. So the strain rate shows where is at a given step the part that is active. And look at this part here, then there, then there, then there. So the core complex is here, but the active part is at the front, and this is the author's part. So we can make an interpretation of this uh, in uh, uh, drawing, drawing the shear zone. So I draw the shear zone here. At the beginning, you get a grab and then two conjugate shear zone. And uh, during a certain uh, time, the system uh, continue to work like this with a sim almost symmetrical uh, pattern, even if the displacement is applied asymmetrically, 
the system is symmetrical with pure shear air at the top. And uh, when uh, the ductile layer that is cooling when moving up, with, this is the brownish color, um, uh, when it arrives to the surface, then the system becomes asymmetrical and starts to uh, grow uh, um, with the displacement of the uh, uprising part following the detachment here, and the detachment form really at this stage. So in this model, the detachment is not from the beginning at the surface. We, we have, uh, I put this fault that we don't see in the numerical model, of course, but uh, we see the detachment very well, uh, and you have seen it in the film, and uh, this uh, implied that at the back here, below the detachment, we have a, a, a pure shear component of deformation passing to a simple shear to the front. Um, I had this sentence here just to summarize something very important. This part shows that this is a localized mode of extension in a hot lithosphere. So the difference between wide rift and core complex is not a difference in temperature at the Moho, but simply that we have some reason for the, the place where the material is exhuming to be localized and wide rift, that extension is everywhere. So the same, the same basic rheology of the lithosphere is able to give either wide rift or core complex according to uh, the fact that deformation is localized or distributed. And uh, uh, I would like to point out here the, the Gulf of Corinth. This is the Aegean. The Aegean uh, underwent uh, a, a big, uh, almost uh, north-south, I will come back on that, uh, uh, stretching. And here we have an enormous uh, core complex. This one is more than 120 kilometer. This is one of the biggest core complex worldwide, uh, the Southern Rhodopi core complex, and we have others here in Bulgaria. Here in the central part of the Cyclad here, we have a hot uh, core complex too, and um, uh, this one started to develop at 45 million years, let's say middle Eocene, here uh, end of Oligocene, and since uh, the late uh, Miocene and during the Pliocene, the Gulf of Corinth is opening. The question is, does this graben will give a core complex? So this is a very disputed question. I, I, I put here um, a number of references uh, where people interpret uh, this seismicity here as um, um, fault activity uh, close to the brittle ductile transition. So ductile below and brittle above. And these are other references, and there are more than that, uh, that interpret this as a detachment. In fact, if we look at the, the experiment, uh, analog experiment or numerical model, uh, we have good reason to argue that this uh, curve zone, curve envelope of the zone of uh, 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 cluster of seismicity there, plus that the, the focal mechanism there, uh, focal mechanism fit quite well with the uh, the fault observed at the surface, um, this could be simply a, a, a graben, the, the opening, and uh, uh, accommodating an up, a rise of the brittle ductile transition, and, and, and it's probable that this will become a core complex. And another argument here, you have the uh, uh, tomography uh, image of the slab below the Aegean, and the current rift is here. So we have a, a, a strong decoupling between the crust and the slab. The asthenosphere came here, and this is a very hot crust. Um, now, let's go back to another argument coming from the modeling. Uh, the modeling showed that we, have, uh, we can have pure shear at the back and simple shear at the front. And taking the section I show you on the <coughs> the Snake Range, there was a student of Elizabeth Miller who long, oh, it is not that, the, the date, I'm sorry, it is much earlier than that, who made a, a study with a quartz fabric 
showing a rather symmetrical uh, pattern at the, the back here and passing to very asymmetrical uh, um, uh, fabrics uh, uh, toward the east where we have the detachment plunging there. This is one of the most beautiful study of this type that uh, I know. There are others, but not so beautiful than that. This suggests again that uh, we have a stage of uh, up uprising of the brittle ductile uh, transition and, and then formation of the detachment. Now, a point that on which we, we try to to understand what is going on. Why we have a transition between core complex and wide drift? This is observed in the basin and range. The core complex de develop first, almost everywhere in the basin and range, and then we have wide drift, as you saw on the, the topographic image I show you at the beginning. And we have this also in the, in the, in the Aegean. And uh, here, are uh, two models that we did with Céline Tirel and Dimitrios Sokoutis. Um, uh, here you have a core complex, the velocity was uh, five millimeter per hour, and here you have a wide rift uh, in almost the same condition, a uh, rheological condition for the two models. At 1.4, this is a, a, a factor three of uh, uh, extension rate. So let's, let's have a look to the Aegean. Um, so I told you that this one here uh, started to develop at 45 million years, this one at 30. And uh, what happened in, the, in this area is that we get uh, subduction with the piling up of uh, uh, the blue unit at the base, the, the purple unit in the middle. I, I pass on the name of that. And uh, the yellow at the top. So this is the image. Uh, in early Eocene, uh, after the end of the piling up of this uh, uh, unit in the subduction zone. And then the, the, the slab here start to roll back and to move uh, south first and then southwest. And we obtain the core complex here uh, between uh, Eocene and Lower Miocene, and the beginning of uh, the core complex uh, here in the Cyclades, uh, a bit later in the Oligocene, Lower, lower Miocene. And then, in the uh, in, uh, middle, middle Miocene, we have rifting everywhere in the Aegean. And uh, this is a section, I will come on that, a section taken here. Um, this is a model that uh, explains the opening, and uh, uh, it, is, it is designed to take into account the fact that the core complex opened in rotation. So you see the, the comparison between the top view of the model here and the core complex there. And here is a sketch of uh, these two zones of uh, uh, stretching that appear there. And you see that we have a first uh, core complex developing there at the, at the top in the wedge. This is the truss wedge. And uh, then the southern one uh, uh, continue to extend when the others almost die here at, 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 in the northern part of uh, the domain. And um, here you have uh, a very simple explanation for the location of uh, the core complex. They develop where the buoyancy is the strongest. When the slab is moving back, this part here is much thicker and the buoyancy force is stronger. And then we get the extension starting here and then moving southward together with the retreat of the stop. And this arrived to more than 120 kilometers for the southern Rodopi core complex. If we had here around 50 kilometers, this is a huge amount of extension taken up by core complex. Okay, so during the first stage of uh, the core complex, this is a map of the Paleogene Basin in orange. They are all located in the northern part, um, 
And suddenly, in the Neogene Basin that developed during, uh, after the Middle Miocene, you see that on 1,000 kilometers, we have the basin everywhere. So we pass from a very localized uh, mode of deformation with core complex and few basin to a basin everywhere. So there is a big change in the behavior of the system. And in fact, restoring, restoring the, I, don't, I will not enter into that, but when we restore the present day situation and arriving to 45 million years in middle, e, middle Eocene when the core complex start to develop, uh, we see that we have localized extension uh, down to 15 million year and then distributed extension up to now. And uh, uh, the tomography show that we have a slab tear here. This is the present day view along this section. Uh, we don't know, we don't know when this started, of course. We have no argument to know when it started. But because we had this big change in the mode of extension, we expect that this occurred in early Miocene. So it, it could be simply because the, the slab was cut. I will not enter into the reason why the slab is cut, allowing the slab to retreat faster. And when we plot the velocity, during 30 million years, the mean velocity is 0.6 centimeter per year. And after 15 million years, during 10 million years, it rises up to 1.7 as a mean, and then to 3.2. And if you know the, the GPS uh, pattern in this area, the velocity of Crete is 3.2, 3.3 centimeter per year. And, and this was not at all calculated to fit that. It fit with it. It is just the restoration that showed that. And, and here I put again uh, the two model. We pass, we have an order of magnitude of five, a factor of five between this and this. So we changed the velocity very much since the middle Miocene. So it was a very slow extension during 30 million years. And in the last 15 million years, it was multiplied by a factor of five. And the, the model show that when we do that, we pass from core complex to wide rift. My last point, probably the most conflictual, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that a number of people here disagree with what I say before. Uh, this is science. Science is disagreeing and, and opposing ideas. So it's not a problem for me if you disagree with me. No problem. But here, probably, I will find the, most, the biggest number of people who disagree with that. Um, this is a work we did quite recently with my, my young colleague, Philippe Yamato, because we were, I am thinking about that since long, and Philippe is an expert in uh, numerical modeling of exhumation of uh, uh, high pressure rocks, uh, ultra high pressure rocks. And uh, we, 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 proposed something that uh, probably will shake some, the mind of some of you. In general, if you look at this problem in textbook or in most publication, uh, you will see that the exhumation of high pressure uh, metamorphic rocks uh, correspond to what is called a subduction channel. That means that the slab is, is subducting here, pulling material down, and at a certain depth, the material decides to move up and arrive at the surface. This is the subduction channel. So there are different modalities of this. There are plenty of uh, uh, numerical models uh, who we'll try to explain the different modalities of that. And um, in fact, we have two field examples, at least, who, where it is clearly demonstrated that exhumation occur in extension. And that these two uh, cases are called eduction or driven by slab rollback. 
So let's, let's consider this first. So this is an, uh, uh, the first idea of the deduction as proposed by Torge Anderson and co-workers. I see Torge in the room. Uh, and uh, working on the, the southern, southwestern Norway, where they have the ultra-high pressure uh, rocks and a lot of eclogites, they arrived to the idea that uh, a part of the continental crust was subducted and uh, uh, there was a detachment of the slam uh, and allowing the material to move up um, and exposing the rocks where, that were very deep to the surface in extension. This is eduction. Eduction means that you inverse the subduction. So there was a subduction, detachment of the slab, and if you move the upper plate, then the, the crust that has been subducted is able to move back. This is a synthesis that I modify a bit to show the displacement uh, from Acker and co-workers quite recently. Uh, where you see here the compression with the subduction of the continental crust, making the uh, ultra-high pressure rocks here, and all these dots correspond to the eclogites. And with the displacement of the tip here of the ultra-high pressure rocks, you, 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 you can evaluate from their drawing around 100 kilometers of displacement here, and this brings back the ultra-high pressure here uh, in this area in Norway. And this is a, a, a diagram from uh, Fosen that syn synthesized all the available data showing that which pattern of extension is able to accommodate this exhumation of the rocks there. Here are models made by uh, Thibaut Duretz with Taras Guerrien, Boris Kaus, and Torgan Andersen. And that shows something very interesting. Here you have uh, the closure of an oceanic basin with the subduction. Uh, the slab here detach, and because the slab has detached, if you allow some uh, di reverse displacement here, then the subduction, the past subduction zone is inverted, and the material is <coughs> brought back to surface. <coughs> I couldn't continue, <laughs> sorry. So here you have an enlargement of this where you see the subduction, so the material is going down here and detachment of the slab, slab break off and because the slab is detached, then the system can extend and uh, as uh, shown on the map, uh, by, on the map uh, west of Norway, you get extension of the, the upper plate and the material is moving up in extension. Okay, so this was proposed quite long ago by Torge and his co-workers. And uh, with, with Claudio Facena, we proposed something more adapted, a bit different, more adapted for the, the, uh, the Aegean, where we have a block uh, subducting. So the block, when it is subducting at a certain step, is totally sheared from the ongoing uh, slab, then the slab is able to move back, to roll back, and the material move up to the surface. Um, this are uh, the section I show you where we have the piling up of the units. And if you see the units blue here, that is this one, uh, where you have the blue shears and eclogites, uh, they move back here to the surface with the extension. So this is a numerical model that shows that, where you have, uh, so it goes a bit fast, so it's difficult to follow, but if you look at the, the purple one here, you see it goes down and, uh, and goes up like that. So in a schematic way, you have the purple block going there, a trust, 
okay? And because the snap is rolling back, then the, the purple unit that has been shortened is able to extend and to come back flat at the surface. And this remind, uh, uh, mimics uh, one step of uh, caterpillar walk. Uh, the, the, the caterpillar makes this and then push its front. And it is something like that that's happened in the, in the Aegean according to us. Okay, my last point now and the most conflictual. Extension, exhumation and extension is not so well accepted. But this, I believe, can put a lot of stress to people. There are two ways to interpret the pressure that is recorded in the rocks. So one is to consider that this is the sort of part of the stress tensor. So it has been developed in all detail by Petrini and Podlyatchikov quite long ago. And uh, in this case, because sigma 2 is equal, uh, approximately equal to P, the pressure in the rock is sigma 1 plus sigma 3 divided by 2. This is in old textbook of mechanics. The first course on stresses say that. The other way is to assume that the pressure in the rock is just the weight of the pile of rock over a certain point. And then the pressure is the density multiplied by the acceleration of gravity and, and the depth. Um, what is recorded in the rock, and the petrologists know how to make this with, with lots of details, is a going down uh, with rising pressure down to a point that we call peak pressure, then we to have a quite steep retrograde pass in general, not, not, not uh, every time, and then uh, a low angle way back to the surface. And this corresponds to a pressure drop, drop that at some places is very fast. Here we plotted the peak pressure against the pressure drop for a number of available uh, data published in the International Journal that display an apparent linear relationship between the two. So what, what can be the significance of this? So here I put, we put with uh, Philip Yamato, we put here the rollback situation and here the eduction situation. So we have subduction, the material is going down, so we have a peak pressure somewhere there or somewhere there. In this case, it is the slab that roll back and allow this material to go back to the surface. In this case here, it is the upper plate that I extend, and after the slab break off, permit the material to arrive to the surface. If we make an attempt of uh, quantifying this uh, by assuming that the material is brittle, is frictional, uh, uh, the pressure in compression for at a certain depth whose pressure would be here, the pressure in compression is here, at the center of the Mohr circle here, and in extension, there. So if we pass from compression to extension, then we have the pressure drop here and the peak pressure here. When we do that, and when we plot the line coming from this, the line is the black one here, just in the middle of the distribution we observe. So the criticism comes immediately. Yes, of course, but this is because you say that this is frictional. And everyone knows that uh, echo guides are ductile. Then we put here uh, four lines calculated for different uh, pressure, uh, uh, where we have a cutoff for uh, ductile uh, behavior. So here, the cutoff is above uh, the two circle, so we are purely frictional. Here, we have a cutoff affecting the compression, and it is uh, this part here. And here we have the cutoff affecting compression and extension, and it is this. And what you observe 
is that in all cases, the domain of ductile deformation fit with the observation. So whatever frictional or ductile, uh, uh, it seems that this could be a, a switch between compression and extension is able to explain what we observe there. And uh, um, the conclusion of this is that uh, the, this good fit sustained that exhumation of high pressure, ultra high pressure rocks occur in extension, even where we have no evidence for that, provide a simple physical process, stress switch, to explain the apparent ascent of apparent ascent. This is just a change in the stresses, not a movement, of uh, UHP rocks, sometimes extremely fast, up to 80 kilometers in few million years at some places, in the Alps, as an example. And shows, with a restoration of the PT pass, so the, this is the PT pass in black here, into a lithostatic frame here. So when we restore that in depth and uh, lithostatic pressure, this pass, instead of being this, is this, become this. That gives uh, 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 an image of a travel down and up along the subduction zone. As simple as that. So no complication to, to go further. But now the question is open and you can find other explanation if you want. Okay, some remaining questions because I have almost finished my time in research. So the game is in your end now. Uh, but there are some open questions of course. What I told you is what I feel. Maybe you feel differently, but there are problems that still continue to, to ask questions to us. Uh, the core complex in their geodynamic setting. There is no very good synthetic view about that. And uh, this would require a lot of work. The difference between detachment and decollement. I pointed out that the decollement is, is, has not the same mechanical meaning than the detachment. So, it could be interesting in the future to, to think about that, even if the, uh, the American considered that these are two synonymous words. Uh, okay, if they are synonymous, we have to find another word, word because, because there, is, there are two different situations that we should take into account. Mental exhumation at massive margin. I pointed out the problem. Uh, we would need a geological, geophysical test for models uh, in the future. Extensional exhumation of high pressure rocks. It's just the end of my presentation. So now, uh, uh, if you disagree with what Philippe Yamato and I propose, uh, we are ready to discuss with you. And I cannot finish that without addressing thanks to a lot of people. First of all, the EGU, the Art Homes Committee and the Nomination Committee to award me this incredible honor. And I can tell you when I received the first announcement of that, I believe it was a joke, a very bad joke, but <laughs> it was not. And I feel extremely honored. Uh, the University of Rennes 1, the University of Paris 7, and the Institute of Physique du Globe, the APGP, who have been my best environment for 40 great years of teaching and research. My PhD student and postdoc, uh, that were my everyday stimulus, uh, probably my biggest satisfaction along these four decades. Of course, a lot of friends and colleagues from University of Berlin, Boston, MIT, Cambridge, Grenoble, Karlsruhe, Montpellier, or you can read all of them. Uh, I have a lot of friends and also the industry uh, who have been extremely important uh, and very precious partner in project and discussion. And you, too, and the EGU that you represent, I would like to thank you very much.
I was asked to, to lead the discussion, and first of all, I would like to thank Jean-Pierre for this absolutely fantastic overview of all of the research which you have been doing and all of your colleagues, your students and your friends. So thank you for this wonderful presentation. And uh, we have time, we have about 10, times for, uh, 10 minutes for questions, and it's a big room and it's a little bit noisy here, so those who have questions, please use microphones so that everyone can hear. So, are there any questions uh, to Jean-Pierre? Well, lots of people are leaving, <laughs> it's uh, lunchtime. Uh, and I cannot really see anyone raising the hand. Oh, yes, please. Hi, it was a really nice talk. Uh, I'm just, you, you, say that, you said that um, uh, uh, to go through the core complex mode, uh, we can switch for high angle faults to, to low angle detachment fault with the same rheology. Uh, so I'm just wondering... But with the same rheology, you switch from detachment core complex to wide rift. A lot of rift. But you, you, you said as well that uh, with the same rheology we can have both, case, both cases. The, the same layering, but changing the velocity. This changes the, the strength of the ductile layer. Right? Because, in, because um, I'm just wondering if you consider the same rheology, how do you explain that you can, you can bend? No, it was a, a, a mistake to say the same rheology. It, okay. it, it, it is. The same layering, ductile brittle, but if you change the velocity, then the strength of the ductile layer increases. And then the coupling between the two layers, brittle and ductile, increases, and you pass from a core complex to wide drift. So the, the main process so I, is the uh, My point is that okay. the distinction made by, uh, by uh, Roger Buck at the beginning that the more temperature was higher for core complex probably is not the best explanation for core complex. Okay. Uh, my, my, my explanation is that core complex need a very low strain rate, very, very low strain rate. And if you increase the strain rate, like in the basement range or in the gym, then you pass to wide drifting. Okay, thanks. That was yeah. my point. Any more questions? Well, we're also uh, running. Uh, do you have a question there? Oh, yes. So, to, to follow up on the previous one, can you go from uh, wide spreading back to core complexes if you slow the velocity? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't pick up. Clearly so, the so can you go from wide distributed wide spreading yes. back to core complexes? Um, I don't know any case, but, but it could be an example if I am right with the current rift. But the point is that where is the current rift? It was not extended before. Extension is just starting since the end of Miocene there. So we had uh, wide rifting in the Aegean proper, in the sea, right? And we start having extension on the mainland in Greece since the late Miocene. Okay. So laterally, we had wide rifting, and maybe we will have core complex uh, uh, moving laterally, right? So we cannot say that we will have core complex where there was wide drifting. But I, maybe it exists, but I don't know any example. I think that we need to stop right now and uh, continue discussions in a more uh, relaxed atmosphere some, somewhere uh, in other places because people who are coming for the next session are already crowding there. So I would like to thank Jean-Pierre once again uh, for this wonderful presentation. And I would also like to remind the uh, Solid Earth community that in five minutes there is another medal lecture. It's the medal lecture in geodynamics division and it will be in room K1.